Well, we are going to go ahead and get started. So I see that there are three of you, which is awesome, because I love little science helpers, whether there's one or a million, little science helpers are the best. Um, so today we're going to be talking about mythology. And I think we all know that science is cool. Science is the best. But did you know we didn't always know the science that we know? So for a really long time, the Earth has existed. So there's the beginning of time. That's when the Earth, you know, everything happened. Here's an Earth sitting there. Everything that we know about science today was happening then the exact same way it's happening now. But we didn't start existing till about 200,000 years ago. Do you think those people knew about science? Of course not, because they were brand new. They were brand new original people. And then we have to look at today. Here's us sitting in 2020 in our homes because we can't go outside. Um, so in, within that time span, that 200,000 years ago to today, we learned a lot. We know about all this stuff that goes on in, in, the, in space, on earth, under the sea. We know all these wonderful things. But before they knew that stuff, they had to come up with a story, something to explain what they were seeing. So they called those myths. Well, they probably didn't, we called them myths, but they called them stories, they called them beliefs, whatever it was. So a myth is an old story that explains something we don't understand. Yet. And there's a lot of them. So today we're gonna to talk about some myths and you'll notice there's a lot of Greek and Roman. We're gonna talk a lot about Greece, we're gonna talk a lot about Rome. And the reason for that is that they were one of the first ancient cultures to have a way to write stuff down. So there were cultures that existed long before the Greeks and Romans, but they didn't know how to write. They didn't have a system of writing. So they just would tell the stories, like I might tell lab assistant Tracy a story and she goes home and tells her son and he tells a friend and that's how that story passes along. But we don't have any way to remember it today from 100,000 years ago. Another reason is that, and something we're gonna talk about today is that myths are not the same as a faith or a religion. None of the things we're gonna talk about today are still believed. So. So people have faiths, they have different religions, and those are things that are still actively believed today. We're not gonna be talking about those. We're talking about things that a long time ago people believed and now they're like, that's silly, that's just a story because we know the science. Also, the Greeks borrowed a lot of their myths from Rome. They were totally copycats. And that's so that they have to share most of their stories. Greece and Rome have really common mythology. But you already know the Latin names, you know about, about Mercury, Venus, Mars and Jupiter, you know, the planets, they're named after Roman gods. So we're going to be using the Greek names today for a little bit of fun. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a very, very dark place and a very, very happy place and a little bit of a kidnapping. So Hades ruled the underworld. Let's talk about Hades. Hades was Kind of in charge of everybody that had died. They all were in the underworld. It wasn't a bad place, it was just And Hades came up one day and he saw Demeter walking with her beautiful daughter, Persephone. Demeter was the goddess of harvest. Persephone was her beautiful daughter who a lot of different Greek groups believed was the goddess of spring. Hades immediately fell in love with Persephone and he's like her, she's the wife. That's the one I'm marrying like right now. So he just takes her to the underworld, which is kind of kidnapping. Persephone didn't seem to mind though. She actually really liked Hades and they got married and they lived together. Demeter was not having this. She was like, did you just take my kid? My kid who is literally spring. So she cursed the earth to darkness and cold. And Hades was okay with that because he was under the ground. But Persephone's like, mm, I probably should do something. So Demeter and Hades made a deal. That six months of the year, Persephone would live with him in the underground. And half of the year, she would live with her mom on the surface. That is why, according to the Greeks, that we have summer, winter, fall, and spring. We have the warmer months when, Demeter, when Persephone is up with Demeter, and we have the colder months when she's down with her husband, Hades. That is a myth. That is not how seasons work. So how do seasons work? This is my tiny earth. I'm gonna drag you guys a little closer so you can see my tiny earth. And you'll see that there's paper clips. There's not actually paper clips on the real earth. 
Don't go looking for giant paper clips up where Santa is. This is our axis. So a lot of planets, let me get my sun up here. Bam, the sun. A lot of planets rotate just like this, perfectly straight up and down. So that, get, that causes a day. We have sun on this side, it's nighttime over here, but Earth doesn't, ro doesn't rotate like that. Earth sits at a tilt, about a 23 degree tilt. So we know that as the Earth goes around the sun, it's on a tilt and it's rotating on a tilt like this. So one time around the sun is a year. One time around in a circle on the axis is a day. So while it's daytime here in Australia, it's nighttime over here, but it's also winter because even as this rotates, you see the sun never touches this top. And if it does, it's kind of the, off to the edge a little bit. That's why it's winter because we have this axial tilt. And so, no, it had nothing to do with Persephone. It had nothing to do with Hades. It had everything to do with axial tilt. So they also believed that a man named Helios took a chariot and drove across the earth every single night that they would see him slowly take his chariot through and then he would just disappear day and night. It doesn't work that way. Here's my bigger earth. There's you standing there and you're over here and it's daytime because the sun is shining on you. It's daytime. And then the earth continues rotating and oh no, oh it's night. Rotation. So rotation and axial tilt. Our earth sits in a unique way and that's the reason we can live here. It's also the reason we have seasons and it's the reason we have day and night. But there's something else in the sky, the moon. And I love this story. So I decided that I didn't want to do all Greek and Roman. I wanna do myths from all over the world because I've learned all these wonderful stories and I wanna be able to share them. And they can't all just be about like Greece and Europe. So this is the story of Sheng E and Hu Yi. So Hu Yi had a potion that he could become immortal, which and immortal means live forever, never die. But he didn't want to drink it because he loved his wife Cheng E so much. He couldn't imagine life without her. And, but he knew that there was only enough potion for one. He didn't want to part from his beloved wife. So she said, I'll take care of it for you. I'll watch the potion for you and I'll guard it and I'll make sure nobody can get it. Now, Hu Yi was a teacher, and he had a student, a very, very bad student who needed all of the detentions ever. He was going to miss every single recess. And that was Feng Meng. And Feng Meng came to his house one day, came to Hu Yi's house, and said, give me that potion. And Hu Yi wasn't home, but Cheng E was, and she said, no, not giving you the potion. I'm watching this for my husband, for Hu Yi. And he said, well, you're going to give it to me. And he was very, very mean to her. And so she drank it. But what Hu Yi didn't know is that it wouldn't make him immortal as a person, as a man here on earth. And so as soon as Cheng A drank it, she zipped off into space. She became the moon. And so in China, they have the Chinese moon festival. And that's the day when the moon is brightest, when it's closest to China. And they celebrate Cheng A and her sacrifice that she made so that her husband didn't have to. And they think she's beautiful, which the moon is beautiful. But she's not alone because Chang'e was known to always have her friend who was a rabbit with her. And if we look at these pictures, you can see, you can see her rabbit friend. He went with her. And so when we look at the moon, we see something like this and we say, that's the man in the moon. He's got, he's got two eyes here, he's got a mouth. They don't see that. When they look at the spot, they see a jade rabbit. And they know that that's Chang A's friend who's staying with her. That's not how science works. The moon, we don't actually know how we got the moon. We think either it's a little dust particle that formed and formed and formed and got stuck in Earth's orbit, kind of like this, or that maybe an asteroid came along and, poof, and ran into Earth a really long time ago before there were people and it broke off and became the moon and got trapped in our orbit. And we don't know. We actually don't know how we got the moon. But we do know that those spots on the moon, the things that look like a rabbit, those are craters. They're just, they're little spots where the moon has been hit with things that is divided down into it. It's kind of dug in. That's what causes the black spots on the moon. Do they kind of look like cheese holes? Yeah. Do they kind of look like 
a man in the moon? Yeah. Do they kind of also look like a jade rabbit? Sure. Have you ever looked at clouds and said, that looks like a fish? But it's not a fish, it's just a cloud. But it's kind of nice to imagine. And it's nice to have a story like Hu Yi and Chang'e and her jade rabbit. But we got to go back. We're going back to Greece again for this next guy. Oh, it's the Cyclops. So the Greeks and the Romans believed in giant people called titans. They were huge, monstrous beings, what we would call giants today. And one of those types had an eye right here in the middle of the head. Oh, I have another friend joining us. So one of the Titans, or a group of the Titans, had a giant eye right there in the middle of their head. And those were called Cyclops. And the Cyclops were some of the most fearsome beasts in Greek and Roman mythology. Everybody was scared of the Cyclops. But why did they even believe there would be a big person with one eye in the middle of their head? They had never seen a normal sized person with a big eye in the middle of their head. There's no reason that they would think that these people existed. Or why were people so ridiculously big? What lived on earth that was ridiculously big? We know this already, dinosaurs. So you're a Greek, you're out there, you're digging for some reason, you're trying to find water, you're digging up potatoes or whatever Greeks ate, and you come across the biggest bone you have ever seen in your entire life. And you're gonna think, that's a mighty big person that had that bone. I've never seen an animal or a person that size. So somebody must have existed. And we know about the Titans. It's gotta be a Titan bone. They didn't know about dinosaurs. But then they also found skulls of a certain creature. And those skulls, just a second. Those skulls looked a lot like this. Kind of looks like an elephant, but a really, really big elephant, a woolly mammoth. And if you look on the woolly mammoth, there's a big hole right in the middle of their foreheads. That, if you've ever had like where you're stuffy when you're outside and you're like, something's all stuck up in my nose, that's your sinuses. And you have a big sinus right here. Yours are a little bit smaller than a mammoth's, but you have sinus cavities as well. If you look on the side of these skulls, you see that there's little divots. That's where their eyes were. They didn't have an eye in the center. They had eyes off to the side, just like an elephant today has that. But we looked at these skulls with no eyeballs, obviously, because they're only bone and the eyes aren't made of bone. And we saw this big hole and thought, that's a very big creature with one eye right in the middle of their forehead. So what we thought were, what the Greeks thought were titans were just dinosaurs and what they thought were cyclops were mammoths, which I think mammoths are very cool. And I hope that someday we can clone mammoths because I personally want to ride one. I'm very excited. So now we need to talk about something from Malaysia. Now if I had my little globe up here, this is us. Here we are in Ohio. Malaysia is like here. So pretty far away from us. Malaysia is in Southeast Asia. And they have a creature called the Barang Sanoi, or a group called the Barang Sanoi, or Barang Semai, depending on where in Malaysia they are. And that was a tribe that actually don't exist anymore, fortunately. Um, kind of like there's some Native American tribes that we know existed before, like the Mayan, but they don't really anymore. The Barang Sanoi or Barang Semai were the same type of thing. And they believed that there was a huge snake that circled the earth, kind of like Helios in his chariot that we talked about. So here was our rainbow snake just going through the sky leaving behind his colors because he moved so quickly. And they're like, well, we don't see him at night, so he must be on the other side of the earth at night. He's given us rainbows. And they weren't the only people that believed in something producing rainbows. We also have Iris, who's a Greek goddess. And they thought that, so the Greeks understood painting. They actually created beautiful paintings, none of which we can see because they've all broken down over time because paper breaks down and cloth breaks down. We don't have Greek paintings, we only have sculptures. But they knew that smearing of paint, you guys have painted before, you get your brushes out and you smear it. They thought she was flying so quickly that she was leaving a smear of paint through the air and that that was the goddess Iris. She was the goddess of rainbows. Does the word Iris sound familiar at all to you? Because you have an Iris on your body right now. And I'm going to show you my Iris because it's right here. It's the colorful part right there in the eye. That is a Dr. Eureka iris. You all have one too. 
looks something like that. That actually is my eye up close. Cameras are very good now. Um, and I got, who doesn't take pictures of their eyes up close when they're bored? So you have an iris and it's called that because of the bright colors which we associate with Iris the goddess. So I'm gonna do a little experiment with you. The problem is this doesn't show up very well. You would be able to see this so clearly if you were here in my lab with me, but you're not gonna be able to see it very well. So I did take a picture of what it looks like, but I'm gonna try this to see if you can see the rainbow. So this is something you can do at home. I did not have a mirror, so I had to use the mirror on my hairbrush. But if you put a mirror in a glass of water and you shine a light directly across the mirror so that it touches, so that the light goes across onto the paper, as you move it, you'll start to see rainbows form. And my glass has like ridges, so I actually get a bunch of different rainbows, but there's one, there's one, there's one. And I know it's really, really hard to see. There's a really bright one right there. But you can do this at home. Just put a mirror inside a glass of water and shine a light across the mirror and you'll have a rainbow too. So I took a picture for you of what it did earlier today. So there's the rainbow that my glass made. And you can see the red, you can see the yellow and the greens and the blues as we made our own rainbow. It's not a snake. It's not iris. It has nothing to do with your eyeball. That's just color. A rainbow is what happens. So white light is this color bright white light like we see coming out of the sun it is every color together but that sounds silly doesn't it you erase things and you get to white paper why would white include everything that's just the way light works black is the absence of color and white is all of the colors it just happens to appear white to us so when we take that white light and we break it apart with a prism like a mirror we get all of the colors of the rainbow so what happens when we're seeing them in the sky the clouds and the dampness in the water itself are acting as the prism. And so the white light from the sun is hitting it and forming a beautiful arch. If you would like to know more about that, we have this awesome book called What Causes a Rainbow by Janet Slingerland. And I read this today because I was waiting for you guys to get to my lab and I got very impatient. And fortunately, I have a lot of science books in my lab. So I read this and I think this is wonderful. And it has, a very interesting picture of a prism. And if you look, as the white light comes in, it hits this prism and boom, it just breaks apart into a rainbow. So this is a very cool book. And that is rainbows. Not a snake. Sorry, Barong Samai, it's not. So who are we gonna talk about next? Let's see, oh, who's ready to get angry? Not me, I'm never angry. I get to do science all day, why would I be angry? But you know who do get angry? The gods. Once you start reading mythology from all around the world, you find out they get angry so easily. They really need to spend some time in a science lab. Because if they did, they wouldn't be nearly as angry as they are. But the gods being angry and pouting and stomping their feet and raging is why we get, it's where we get the stories for all these massive things that happen on earth, like hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and mountains forming, all this big stuff that has nothing to do with gods being angry. But we believe that, or the Greeks believed that, because they didn't understand the science. So let's talk about this dude first, Mr. Mayan Hurricane. So he got angry and supposedly would get into the ocean and just splash around, kind of like you do in the swimming pool, where you just splash around all over the place. Because he was so massively big, he caused these big currents to start. That's a picture of an actual hurricane. But we know that hurricanes are just wind. It's wind that hits a certain place and it starts turning and it gains power and strength as it goes. And they're very dangerous, but they're, they're not a god being angry. But we did get the name hurricane from the god Uraka who was a Mayan and I believe an Aztec god. But what about earthquakes? Time to get out some plates. Not to eat. We're not, we're not eating plates, right? When, they're not eating plates. They're called tectonic plates. So if you look at this map, you'll see that there's an Indian plate and a Eurasian plate and an African plate. There are plates everywhere and they're way down underneath the ground. We see a solid dirt, that's the crust. And underneath that is a layer called mantle. And the mantle is not solid. It's all these big giant puzzle pieces moving around, but they don't move that fast. They move like this. 
See how you couldn't see that? Yeah, you can't see tectonic plates moving. It's really, really, really slow. But when tectonic plates move, they cause a lot of different things. So we're going to do another experiment, and you can do this one at home if you can get it to work. If you take two pieces of paper and you pretend that they're tectonic plates, so let's say this one is the Indian plate and this is the Eurasian plate, and we push them like that, what do they do? They formed a mountain. That mountain, in the case of those two plates, would be the Himalayas. So we have those two. The North American plate is broken. When, we, when they push together, it forms the Rockies or the Appalachians. So that is an important thing. But what happens if it slides like this and it goes under or it goes over or it pushes down? That's how you get earthquakes. Earthquakes are when the plates bump into each other and they do not say, excuse me. They also don't form a mountain. They just kind of under each other. So we're going to look at a little thing and we can see that when it goes like this, that's a plate moving. And anything that's sitting on that's going to get pretty shaky. So that is the exciting world of earthquakes. And you probably have never seen a hurricane. You, I hope that none of you have ever lived through an earthquake, but I know that there's a weather thing caused by an angry god that you've seen before. And it is caused by this guy right here. No, not him, not that one. That's Marvel. No, this guy right here. Thor and his mighty hammer Mjolnir. All you Marvel kids are going crazy right now because hey, it's Thor. But Thor is why we have thunderstorms. Because as we all know from our Marvel movies that we love, you get the zap of lightning and that he has lightning in his eyes and he's huge and the hammer comes down and it goes boom and it rumbles. That's not how thunderstorms happen. It's just not. So we're going to talk a little bit about thunderstorms because I think they're fascinating. And unfortunately, the experiment I had planned to show you guys with this, I can't actually show you because it doesn't show up on the camera, which is, and I didn't like it, but it involves lightning, which is very cool. And it was going to be the most explosive -y one. So instead, you just have to go with a picture. Sorry. So thunderstorms are interesting because you have electric running through the wires of your house, right? You have wires and all the electric is running along those. That's because electric likes to travel in a channel. But there's channels in the air. There's kind of the path of least resistance, if that's what they call it. I know that's big, that's big terms. But when you have water that's sliding down and it can hit a block or it can go around it, it's going to go around that block. Electricity does the same thing. It, it doesn't want to have to fight through a block. It's just going to re-navigate and continue. That's why lightning looks the way it does. It's electricity not in wires in your house, but in the sky, static electricity that comes down and it finds the easiest path to get to the tallest thing that it can find and makes that path. So before we get into what causes thunder, have you guys ever like been walking around your house and you touch something metal and it goes and it zaps up your arm? That's static electricity. Lightning is static electricity on steroids. It's just so much that the sky can't hold on to that electricity anymore and it goes zap. And it travels so fast that and it expands and then poof, it snaps away. And that sound is thunder. So if anybody ever asks you which comes first, the flash or the sound, it's the flash. It'll always be the flash. So that is thunderstorms and it has nothing to do with Thor, even though he is awesome. Now we're going to tell another little fun story. We're going back to Greece. I told you, a lot of these are Greek. We're going to talk about Scylla and Charybdis. I like those names. So this dude, Odysseus, he goes on a journey, an odyssey, if you will. He goes on a trek, and the gods are angry. They don't want him to make it home. Don't worry about why the gods are angry. Like I said, they're always angry. And they are throwing everything they can in his way. They're like, no, you're going to get off course. No, you're going to meet some singing mermaids, which were probably manatees. You're going to meet a witch who turns everybody into pigs. Like Greek mythology is sometimes really weird. Um, but one of the things that they had to face was Scylla and Charybdis. That's where we get the term like between a rock and a hard place. Where like, it would not matter where Odysseus went, it was going to be tough. But what were Scylla and Charybdis? To Odysseus, it was a massive whirlpool that, that just swallowed ships in its wake. 
And Charybdis was a, or Scylla was a huge lizard with multiple heads. So let's get into the science of it. What is Scylla? <gasps> oh my gosh, they're so cute. These little dudes are called polycephalic li lizards. So poly means more than one, and cephalic means oh, head. So they were polycephalic lizards. These are actually modern animals. They're ones who mutate or don't aren't born properly, and so they end up with two heads, or sometimes three heads. It's very strange. But imagine that, but it's like a crocodile or a monitor lizard. Would you want to mess with that? Because I wouldn't. So I'd be like, no, 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 Scylla. I don't want a giant crocodile with two heads. I think I'll take my best shot on Charybdis. And now we get to do some science and something you can do at home, because we got to talk about the Mediterranean. This is the Mediterranean River river? Mediterranean Sea. I got to get back into studying my waterways again. So here we are, and the Mediterranean is about oh, here, over just south of Europe, a little bit over there. And it is very odd. It's very low and very high on the bottom of the sea. It's the most variable height sea in the entire planet. And unfortunately, that causes the water to kind of swoop and start to spiral. So if you look in here in the Rhodes Basin, there's a little A. That's where they thought Charybdis was, this massive whirlpool that swallowed ships. And if you look, that's really dark purple. That means it's really, really deep. But Odysseus would be traveling here along like the green edge where it's not quite so deep. So of course the ships are gonna get sucked down if it's really, really deep and everything's pulling in like the water going down the drain of your bathtub. So I made a whirlpool. <laughs> This is very exciting. Are you ready? So you can actually make one of these yourself. It's a water bottle and a water bottle. In between the two water bottles, you need to find a washer. I cut the part off of the bottom of a cup and then cut a hole in the center to make the washer because you need to make it so that the bottle doesn't just pour into the other bottle. It has to slow the flow in some way. And then you fill one of the bottles with water and you tape them together. And this is the fun part. I'm gonna try to move it down there a little bit, you spin, and you can actually watch the whirlpool happen, which is very cool. I can't do this over my computer because mine leaks because I didn't have very good tape. Put it in a circle, and there it is. That's basically what happens with Charybdis. The spinning water creates that pull that pulls stuff down into the bottom of the sea probably pretty scary if you're on an old nasty boat that's been sailing around the entire area for a year because that's one of the last things that Odysseus faced so his boat was probably pretty destroyed by then and he's like well it's either that or a giant lizard that's going to eat me with one of its two mouths so I guess you're between a rock and a hard place between Scylla and Charybdis. and now my friends it's time for our last story and it's going to be an awesome one because I like this lady and her fortitude. Fortitude means strength. You're gonna like her too. But do you like spiders? I have a deal with spiders. That spiders are allowed in my house as long as I don't see them, and it's fair game for them to be outside. The minute I see you in my house, no. I don't like spiders that I can see. I prefer the unknown when it comes to spiders. But we know the spiders make beautiful webs, that the string is actually made inside their bodies and they, they create their webs from themselves. They're not sitting there knitting like Charlotte from Charlotte's Web. They actually produce it out of spinnerets in their own body. That's what they're called, spinnerets, things that make web do. Spider-Man has spinnerets, but he made them himself. So the Greeks didn't think that. They're like, how would they possibly produce string out of their bodies. That's so weird. They're, no, they can't have done that. Instead, what must have happened, the gods again. So there was a woman named Arachne, and Arachne was an amazing weaver. She made beautiful fabrics and beautiful tapestries. And Arachne's like, I'm the best weaver in the world. Ain't nobody weaves better than me. Arachne, I'm the best. And Athena, who was a very angry goddess most of the time. She was the goddess of, of intelligence though, so I like her, goddess of science. Woohoo, go Athena. She was like, um, I don't think so. I don't think you're the best weaver because I'm a goddess. So, you know, I'm gonna be the best weaver. 
let's have a little competition, you and I, but the stakes are pretty high. If I win, or if you win, that's fine. You get to say that you were the best weaver, that you beat a god at a weaving contest. But if I win, you're going to be a spider. I'm turning you into one. Because they knew spiders wet weaved webs. If she thought she was such a great weaver, she could weave one as a spider the rest of her life. Well, I think we know what happens because in the Greek mythology, gods never lose. So I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Arachne. Say hello, Arachne. So we have heard the term Arachne, though, because the scientific word for spiders and bugs like them with eight limbs is an arachnid. We actually get that term from Arachne here. It was turned into a spider because she wasn't as good a weaver as she thought she was. So I guess it tells you don't have too much pride in everything you do because you know you don't know if you're the best. You may be the second best, but otherwise you might be a spider. So I hope you learned something today. I know I learned something today. I learned that I can't hold water over top of my computer. That's something I learned today. Join me next year. I'm going to be back. I've already been talking with all these other lab assistants about whether I'm going to come back next year. And I totally am. And I've got some really fun science for next year. So I will see you all later. And thank you for coming to my lab today.